David Hume was hands down the most important philosopher within the Scottish Enlightenment and really one of the most important and influential philosophers of all time. Uh, that's a painting of him on the left there commissioned during his lifetime. In the middle is a statue of him in his hometown of Edinburgh. I don't know if you can see it on the slide there, but his right toe is all bronzed, like rubbed off because people, when they walk by, they'll rub his toe that's sticking out for good luck and good Lord, he would have hated that. And on the right is the David Hume Tower at the University of Edinburgh, my alma mater. The philosophy department used to be there, but it uh, moved just almost next door uh, to the Dugald Stewart building, who was another uh, Scottish philosopher during the, the Scottish Enlightenment. Hugely inf influential philosopher, and we're going to be reading some excerpts of his for this module. Now, reading Hume is kind of like reading Shakespeare if Shakespeare were doing like really complicated philosophy. It's a short read, but it is not an easy read, so I'm going to use this video to help you get through it. Let's get started. So Hume, like a lot of older philosophers and a lot of like really famous contemporary philosophers, he just kind of did everything. You know, metaphysics, epistemology, logic, ethics, you name it, he probably wrote about it. And so unpacking Hume's theories can take a lot of work because you have to look at other stuff that he's written in order to understand what he's doing in this particular bit. And we're going to look at two arguments from Hume, both of which try to get the result that moral opinion, so like moral claims themselves, like aren't derived like through our rationality and instead are tied much more closely to our emotions. So what he's arguing for, he wouldn't have had this terminology really available at the time, but it would have either been some kind of moral subjectivism, or if you take his arguments to their logical conclusions, you might end up with something like emotivism or non-cognitivism. So a really important figure, and these arguments here are going to be important because they will help us frame the rest of the debate when we're looking at ethical theories. And in short, what we'll kind of see is that these ethical theories will end up pushing back on Hume, especially when we look at deontology, which was developed by Immanuel Kant, who is a contemporary of Hume, and whose like whole project was to try to disprove Hume's views. So <clears throat> there's a lot of relevance between David Hume and, and the other stuff that we're going to talk about. So we're gonna look at two arguments, each one in turn, but I do need to lay a little bit of background here. So this is not his argument on, on this slide. This is just the, the background to his argument. And one of the things about Hume, he has this principle, we call it now Hume's fork. And here's the idea. There are really only gonna be, and this is again just his view, there are only going to be two kinds of claims that we can like determine rationally or objectively. These are either going to be what he calls matters of fact or relations of ideas. Now matters of fact are the kinds of things that require empirical investigation. You need to go and figure out the way the world is in order to figure out like if these claims are true. Um, the example I have on the slide here, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd have to go out and, you know, find some water, get a thermometer. I was actually, I was going to use water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, but that wouldn't actually work here because like the Celsius scale is defined in terms of when water boils right at 100 and water, when water freezes at zero. So it's kind of funny that example wouldn't have worked. But the idea is that you go out, you try to figure out like the way the world is, and those are going to be matters of fact. Relations of ideas, on the other hand, are claims that are just basically true by definition, right? Bachelors are unmarried. Squares have four sides. Triangles have three interior angles. 
all of those things are just true in virtue of the terms involved. So as long as you know what the words mean, you can figure out if those statements are true or not. It's not like we have to go out and interview a whole bunch of bachelors to see whether or not they're married. If we come across somebody who says they're a bachelor and they're married, we're going to be like, eh, either you're lying about your marital status or you don't know what a bachelor is. So those are the two kinds of objective, sort of rationally derived truths for Hume. I will say that nowadays this distinction is just kind of considered false. Uh, there's a whole lot going on here. We don't really need to get into it, but we can take Hume at face value. What we need to do is understand his arguments. And so here is the first one that we're going to look at. And again, this argument is based on Hume's fork. It's at the core here of premise one, which says that truths are either going to be that are derived from reason are either going to be relations of ideas or empirical matters of fact, right? That's just what Hume's fork says. Premise two, moral claims are not relations of ideas. Premise three, moral claims are not empirical facts. And so what follows from this, and this is a little bit more complicated, but it is still technically a modus tollens. So what follows here is that moral claims are not derived from reason. And so why would moral claims not be relations of ideas? Well, the thought here is that there might be some terms like murder that is just sort of defined as immoral killing. But there are other things like stealing um, or lying that like, you know, lying is wrong is just not true by definition. It's not the kind of thing that we can just reflect on like we can with squares have four sides and just be like, oh yeah, that's obviously true. So they're not relations of ideas in that sense. And Hume says they're also not empirical matters of fact. It's not like I can go out and investigate whether stealing is wrong. You know, I'm never going to like find wrongness out there in the world. I'll find, you know, acts of stealing, you know, and I'll find all kinds of different things, but I'm never actually going to find wrongness out there in the world. Now Hume is, what we call an empiricist, right? The way that we learn stuff, according to Hume, is just through investigation. And so how on earth are we going to derive moral truths? He's actually really famous for what's called the is-ought fallacy or the is-ought problem. And the idea here is really simple. How can you develop an argument that starts with premises about the way the world is and has a conclusion with the way the world ought to be. And remember, when we're doing ethics, we're talking about what you ought or ought not do. And so this may seem subtle, this may seem tricky, but like that guy is stabbing that other guy. So there's a, an is statement. Therefore, he ought to not stab that other guy. The, that does not follow. That is not a logically valid argument. You can add other premises, right? Um, that guy is stabbing the other guy. Uh, stabbing is really painful. Therefore, you ought not stab people. Again, we're trying to go from an is statement to an ought statement. And Hume suggests that that kind of reasoning is never ever really going to be justified. And, and at least in these cases, we can't even construct a valid argument. We can fudge a little bit, right? We can say that um, if stabbing someone is painful, then we ought not stab. And we could get a valid argument that way with modus ponens, but Hume would say, well, that premise that we just introduced, there's, there's no justification for it. How can you possibly go from a, just a fact about the way the world is to a fact about the way the world ought to be? So famous skeptic in general, but especially when it comes to moral claims. And according to his view on just objective truths and truths that are derived through reason, moral truths just don't fall into this category. They're not true by definition, and they're not the kinds of things that we can go out and investigate. So that is Hume's first argument. His second one, 
has to do with his theory of action and how we like move around the world. What is it that causes us to do stuff? And remember, as we're going through this, the stuff that I test on, the stuff that I want you to understand are the arguments themselves. This is thick material, so you know, take your time with it. You might need to you know, actually not just merely listen to this particular lecture, but you know, maybe sit down and, and engage a little bit more heavily with uh, the material. And also keep in mind that my reading quizzes that I have that go along with the readings, they're meant to be open while you're doing it. I use the reading quizzes to help guide you through the reading and help you like identify what parts are important, what to focus on. So make sure to have that open while you're doing it. So his second argument, this involves his theory of action. And this is going to come up again when we uh, do deontology and we talk about Immanuel Kant. He's going to cut against Hume here. But Hume's idea, this is really interesting. So what he says is that whenever we like act, you know, intentionally on something, so not like when we accidentally, you know, bump into somebody, but when we intentionally do something, there's going to be two sort of faculties that we have involved. The first is what he calls the passions. These are desire states that we have. So this is a feeling that makes some kind of end or some kind of goal seem desirable. The other thing that we have is our, our reason. Um, and these are belief states that we have, sort of cognitive states. Our reason allows us to get the thing that we want. So here's an example, right? Um, I see some cake over there and I desire cake. So I'm like, okay, well, I want some cake. There's my, my passion, my, my desire state. And my rationality says, well, if you want to eat some cake, you better walk over there and, you know, either you know, stick your fist in it or get a, a fork or something, right? And that's how you're going to go and get that cake. What's interesting for Hume, and this comes up again, so it, 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 this is really important in general, this isn't critical to understand Hume's argument, but this does come up again. Sometimes we do find ourselves with conflicting desires. So in the cake example, let's say that I, you know, I see the cake and I really want to eat it, but I'm also on a diet and like I want to lose weight. Well, these are two conflicting desires. What am I going to do here, right? Am I going to eat the cake? Am I going to not? And each of these are associated with certain belief states, right? Um, for the wanting to eat the cake part, for that desire, well, you know, my reason says, hey, go over and eat it. For not wanting to eat the cake, for wanting to maintain my diet, my reason might tell me, you know what, just go ahead and leave the room so that you're not tempted by it anymore. For Hume, what ultimately happens is that one of these passions is just stronger than the other. We don't pick which passion we act on. Instead, we just sort of find ourselves with these various desires, and the strongest ones are the ones that we end up acting on. This actually has some really interesting results for the question of free will. Right? Do we freely choose to do the things that we decide to do? And for Hume, it turns out that, yeah, we do, as long as the thing that we're doing was just caused by our desires. So if I desire to eat the cake and I go and eat the cake, then I acted freely. Did I pick which desire I acted on? No. And, you know, according to Hume, you can't even pick which desire is going to be sort of the strongest, the one that ends up motivating you. But he, he doesn't care. He just stops the story there. And it's like, look, as long as your action is a result of your passions, your desires, then you're fine. So that's Hume's theory of action. Here is his argument. Again, it's quick, but it's, it's thick. There's a lot of philosophical content here. So premise one just says moral opinions can motivate us to act. And in fact, they, they do motivate us to act. This is just according to his theory of action. But belief states that are just about objective truths, they don't motivate us to act. Well, 
Since moral claims do motivate us, but other sort of belief states or rationality does not motivate us, then moral claims can't be those belief states. They have to be something like a passion, a desire. And you can kind of see maybe how tightly that connects to an idea like emotivism. So there is something there, and the emotivists, I think, were, were definitely uh, not crazy for you know taking Hume to that conclusion. Now, just to sort of get a more grounded idea of what he's after, let's just say that um, you know you're on a train track and there's a train headed towards you. What are you going to do? So you have a belief state, right? There's a train that's headed towards me. Are you gonna get off the track? Well, that depends on what your desire state is. If you don't want to get hit by a train, then yeah, you'll get off the track. If you do want to get hit by a train, then you'll stay there. It's your desire state, your passion that ends up determining whether you are going to stay on the track or get off of it. Your belief state is the same in both cases, right? Whether you stay on or get off, your belief state is still, there's a train headed towards me. It's only your desire state, it's only your passion that like is the thing that either determines whether you are going to stay or whether you are going to move. And that story seems to make a lot of intuitive sense. Maybe Hume is onto something here. When we consider moral claims, right, like they are very closely tied to our emotions and our behaviors. If you have the opinion that, you know, stealing is wrong in this situation, then you're probably not going to steal. You might have some other competing passion that says, I really just want this thing. And in that case, you'll steal it. But it's still ultimately our passion states that motivate us and moral truths fall into that category, again, according to Hume. He has this really famous line that uh, it's something like that preferring the destruction of the entire world is uh, over the scratching of my middle finger is not contrary to reason. In other words, like there's, there's just no reasoning aspect to like what you prefer, right? If you prefer the destruction of the world, then that's just what you prefer. There's no like reason that you do it's just that's just what you do you know it would be like somebody asking you like why do you like you know vanilla ice cream over chocolate and you're like i just do but yeah but why what are your reasons and it's like what are you talking about i just like it better that's just how i am i'm i i don't know what to tell you so hume might be onto something here now, as we'll see, we will end up pushing back, especially on the first argument here on premises two and three. We will see that consequentialism might be able to show that actually moral claims can be empirical facts. And when we look at deontology, and in particular Immanuel Kant, he will be pushing back on premise two that actually moral truths are relations of ideas and that we can use pure reason to derive moral truths. So Hume's argument here, it's really interesting on its own, but it also kind of will help us frame the next couple of modules to see how we might end up responding to Hume's argument. Because remember, we're just kind of going to have to assume the truth of moral objectivism in order to get these next modules even off the ground, right? If moral objectivism is false, then there's not really any need to engage in doing any kind of moral theorizing. You know, it's just going to be that, well, these are people's opinions about stuff or these are people's emotive states. So that is Hume. The excerpts are short, the arguments are quick, but like I said, it's, it is not an easy read. Hume is, it's just, you know, it's from the 1700s. It's just not very easy to read. So. Let's summarize everything that we've talked about so far. We talked about moral objectivism, and remember, this is the view that we will be assuming for the rest of the course. And it does, as a view, and a meta-ethical view, it has a lot going for it, right? We're allowed to, on this view, 
condemn immoral practices that we see, whether in other people or in other, other cultures. Um, that's something that relativism can't handle and subjectivism certainly can't handle it. Um, it also, you know, it matches up with a lot of our intuitions. We seem to think, you know, most of us at least, I, I feel like, that there's going to be at least some things that are wrong, like regardless of what you think about them. You know, we could perhaps identify something like slavery that's just wrong. Even if everybody in the world thought it was okay, like it's just not okay to own another human being as property. And if everybody in the world thought that it was, we'd be like, you guys are all wrong. Moral objectivism can make sense of that. Now, we did mention that like, okay, if morality is objective, why are these truths so hard to figure out? Why can't we like discover what these truths are? And of course, this isn't all of that, all that surprising, right? We don't really have, you know, a moralometer, you know, to go out and, and, you know, test different things. We don't have scientific tools we can use. And so the fact that moral truths are difficult to figure out kind of makes sense. And the fact that there's moral disagreement is in line with that. And, and like we talked about last time, just because there is moral disagreement, that's not enough to show that morality is not objective because people disagree about objective facts all the time. I mean, there are still flat earthers running around, people who like could not be more wrong about like the way that the world is. And so, you know, those facts alone are not enough to show that moral objectivism is false. It does have its problems, but like I said, you know, we will need to kind of assume the truth of it for the rest of the course. Moral relativism, the next sort of truthiest meta-ethical view, because you can be wrong on the moral relativist view. And the way that that happens is that your moral opinions differ from the society or culture that you're a part of. So the example that I gave when we were talking about this, if you identify as a Catholic, but you view abortion as morally permissible, you are incorrect, right? Your culture says that it's not. So with moral objectivism and moral relativism, you can be wrong, but the reason that you're wrong is different from each of these, right? Moral objectivism, you're just wrong about the, the facts, right? You know, there's just some moral fact and you're just wrong about it. Relativism, you're disagreeing with the society or culture that you identify with. Moral subjectivism though, you can't really be wrong, right? Because you're, you're just not going to be mistaken about these kinds of desires. You might in general like be mistaken about some preferences that you might have. Like maybe you think that you hate broccoli because you know, you tried it when you were a kid and maybe it wasn't like cooked very well or seasoned very well. So you're just like, oh my God, I hate broccoli. But if you were to try it now, you'd be like, oh, that's pretty dope. And so that might be a case where you're confused or, or wrong about your own preferences, but not for moral claims, right? I don't have to go, you know, try getting shot to know that I am definitely not going to like that. So with moral subjectivism, you can't really reasonably be wrong on this view, which means that like when two people are disagreeing about some moral fact, they're not actually disagreeing at all. They are both making true statements about their own personal preferences. And we closed with uh, non-cognitive, sorry, non-cognitivism, and <clears throat> we focused a lot on emotivism. And on the slide here, I do have um, some stuff that we didn't talk about, how this view follows from a, another view that was pretty popular in like maybe the 1930s through about maybe the 1950s and a view called logical positivism that is just definitely false it's definitely a disaster and so it turned out that when logical positivism was disproven so was emotivism but there still are contemporary non-cognitivist views that are out there as well as contemporary error theories. And remember an error theory just says that all discourse 
within the domain of like morality. So any kind of moral claims that we make, they're all just going to be false. Killing is wrong, false. Killing is okay, false. So those are all the meta-ethical views we looked at. That is Hume that we've looked at, and that's it for this module. This was a lot, so definitely let me know if anything's unclear. I'm happy to meet with you on Zoom in person. Um, if I get enough questions here, I'm, I'm also more than happy to do a supplemental video where you know I try and address those questions in more detail. But please let me know if you need anything. Next time, we're going to be talking about our first proper ethical theory, which is very broadly called consequentialism or maybe more specifically, utilitarianism. But I'll see you then.